All right, okay. He's not sure about signing up to the Patreon, but I'm sure we can all come to an agreement. Sir, what do you think about early access to feature videos? You mean you want me to pay for something I'm gonna get for free in a week tops anyway? Well, there's also bonuses. And what would those be? Uh, creator commentaries? And what is the value in those? Got a license. Um, but we told you he's an Article 4 free inhabitant, so he does not have to have a license. This is on recording. The video you're watching right now was uploaded to YouTube on May 27th of 2013, along with the title Illegal Arrest. The identities of the parties involved remain unknown, so we'll assign the officer the name Officer Steve. As to our heroine filming from the passenger seat, we'll just go with some chick. I'm most likely, just for my safety, because I got a lot going on with this Article 3 or 4. Article 4, free inhabitant, pursuant to the Articles of Confederation. You can look it up, it's in the United States Book of Codes. It is your laws you have to follow. And with that declaration, this chick has just raised a very interesting question. One that cuts to the heart of how any society you could think to name operates. All countries and jurisdictions have laws of their lands and rights bestowed upon the people that reside within those lands. But virtually no law or right can be 100% absolute, as the chaotic nature of life will from time to time present a scenario where certain laws and or rights come into conflict with one another. So the question here is, what happens when the laws that exist within a given jurisdiction come into conflict with the laws and rights that exist within someone's imagination? I have one detained for 12500 I have a passenger. Article 4, no, Article 4 free inhabitant, it's different. So what is an Article 4 free inhabitant supposed to be exactly? Well, the Article 4 part is a reference to the Articles of Confederation, which this chick mentioned a moment ago. Ratified in 1781, when the United States was comprised of 13 colonies, Article 4 lays out how, quote, free inhabitants of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and amenities of free citizens in the several states, and the people of each state shall have free ingress and regress to and from any other state, and shall enjoy therein all the privileges of trade and commerce. What that means in layman's terms is if you were a resident of South Carolina, for example, and you traveled to North Carolina to conduct business, you would immediately be granted all of the same privileges and protections afforded to North Carolinans. Now, driver's licenses weren't really a thing back then, but let's say they were and South Carolina didn't see a need for them while North Carolina did. Article 4 wouldn't dictate you as a South Carolinan were free to roam North Carolina's lands in your 1780 Chevy without having to carry the appropriate paperwork, as Article 4 also states that you as a free inhabitant of South Carolina were still, quote, subject to the same duties, impositions, and restrictions as the inhabitants of whatever state you may be visiting at any given time. As it happens, the Articles of Confederation are completely redundant anyway, as they were replaced by the United States Constitution in 1789. But this chick, and others like her, seem to think the Articles of Confederation trump the Constitution, presumably because they came first, even though this is literally the opposite of how legislation works, and leaving aside the fact that they're completely misunderstanding the meaning of the archaic document they're citing, even if it were still in effect. Okay. Article 4, free inhabitant, pursuant to the Articles of Confederation. Put the camera down for me. Is that, if, if, if it records, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I don't want you holding anything. Uh, no weapons, me. no weapons. All right, no. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is the same thing. And get out of the car? Yes. No, I'm not getting out of the car. Right. You can go get your superior. Well, I am going to tow this car, and you cannot be in the vehicle while I'm towing this vehicle. Well, if you go get your superior, he'll clarify right that he can be set free because he does not that's have not to have a license. That's not going to happen right now, young lady. Demanding a superior is a common play among free inhabitants, or sovereign citizens as they're more commonly known among the public and law enforcement professionals, and for many of them isn't just a stalling tactic, but rather comes from a genuine belief grounded in a conspiratorial worldview. 
That is, not only is their understanding that they have virtually unfettered rights coupled with more or less no responsibilities correct, but the fact they're correct is something higher-ups like sheriffs, judges and elected officials know and fear. A sovereign citizen handbook called Title IV Flag Says Your Schwag even goes as far as recommending you call 911 to request a US Marshal for a citizen's arrest in the event you're encountered by a police officer belligerent enough to keep insisting you produce a driver's license after being informed of your exemption from such laws. So either you're going to come out of the car on your own free will or I'm going to assist you. I'm going to get out of the car and walk down to that house. No. Many sovereigns would regard agreeing to get out of the car as a rookie mistake. Most of them aren't even big fans of rolling the window all the way down, though that's obviously a moot point in this case. Anyway, this chick has obviously taken a give a little to get along approach, which some sovereigns will opt for in the event their initial script doesn't work, which is always. Officer Steve clearly isn't too hot on the idea of letting some chick he's just pulled over wander off to a nearby house without so much as identifying her, but let's see if she can turn him around with some further education. You are not free to leave right now. Uh, you Are you saying you have you, authority over me? Yes, I do. You have proven authority over me? Yes, I do. How did you do that? The County of Imperial through the Sheriff. You do not have authority over a human being right, over well, a free you know inhabitant. What? Do you want to argue the point? You need to go look up your laws. I don't laws. have to look at anything right now. What I need to do is get you out of the vehicle. If you have identification, please hand the identification over to me. No. Identify yourself to me. And I'm not going to step out of the vehicle. Where are you a citizen of? I am not a U.S. citizen. Well, see, that's I am a mistaken. free inhabitant. I am that's of the earth. I do not belong to any corporation. I do not belong to any country. Yeah, no. This is the brilliance at the core of sovereign citizenship. Not only are they not citizens of the United States, they're not citizens of any country or jurisdiction whatsoever. So if they can just get off the hook with Uncle Sam, they won't be beholden to any rules of any kind anywhere. A free inhabitant is 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 uh, they are allowed to they are they are free people they um have all of the all of the rights of a U.S. citizen without following any of their laws. Well, that would just be pure anarchy nope. if that were the no, case. No, 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 Officer Steve's still not getting it. Hopefully, this whole thing can be resolved peacefully. Because so we're peaceful people. Oh, we're peaceful me, people. Please. I'm going to get out of the vehicle and I'm going to walk down to that house no, because you do not have authority no, over not. me. I'll get out of the vehicle for you. And I'm getting water. Following commands in a leisurely manner conveys to Officer Steve this chick is still in control. Smart. All right, well, you're not free to leave. I'm, I, I, you're no, going to take the bag no, off. No, no, I'm not. You're going to take the bag off. No, I'm not. You're not sure. Hey! You're Relax. raping me! Right. This is rape! This Relax is rape! Right. This is rape! Although the physical position of both subjects is not caught on camera at this moment, and would like to give our heroine the benefit of the doubt, based on the two subjects' visible silhouettes from three seconds ago, this seems to be a frivolous accusation. But not one without a purpose. In Title IV Flag Says Your Schwag, crying out in pain and describing the actions taking place to your recorder is encouraged should the officer become, quote, violent. Stop fighting. All right, okay. I'm not fighting. So Here, I'm lifting my arm up, I'm lifting my arm up. Arm right it there. hurt, okay, I just, I told you what I was doing. This is pain compliance, okay? It's not meant to be comfortable. Relax. I'm relaxed. Don't on my back! You got me my back! You don't know your own laws. Relax, young lady. You don't know your own laws. Relax, young lady. Calm down. You're illegally doing this. I told you I was a free inhabitant. You're under arrest. No, I'm not. Give me my stuff. Relax. You son of a bitch. Give me my stuff. You Relax. fucking asshole. You need to calm down. You need to fucking learn your goddamn job because you don't know your fucking laws. And we'll never know for sure why exactly Officer Steve didn't believe that chick, what became of her in the end, or if her arguments ever wound up prevailing in a court of law. But our guess is they probably didn't, based on the fact there has never been a recorded instance of such arguments or anything like them prevailing in any court in the entire history of planet Earth. But a non-existent track record of success hasn't seemed to deter adherents of sovereign ideology from their beliefs. 
In fact, the movement has only grown since its early conception in the 1970s when it was mainly associated with white nationalist groups, because as it turns out, harebrained theories favour no race, colour or creed, and the notion that the most basic of laws don't actually apply to you because of some obscure loophole only you and a select group of fellow travellers are smart enough to understand appeals not only to racial separatists of many shades, but also individuals free of such prejudices. Which brings us to the present day, where the majority of the time if you come into contact with a sovereign, it probably won't be someone with ambitions as grand as establishing a new country for their people, but rather just intent on flouting whatever rules, no matter how innocuous, they feel are being unjustly imposed upon them at any given time. Douchebags, basically. And douchebagesses, of course. Napkin, mama. And it doesn't seem like they spend a lot of time watching captured footage of one another's interactions, because they appear to be invariably cocky, in spite of the fact that countless encounters that have come before them have been documented as not ending well. Please step aside, I'm going in. No, you're not going in. Don't touch me. Let the record show that you just battered me. Step back. And you're using... Oh! Oh! Oh, stop, please. You know what? You guys are really overstepping your bounds right now. Put the cuffs on them. Thankfully, a good old tasing tends to be about as severe as things get when sovereigns stand their ground. And usually things de-escalate well before that if the officer is skilled enough to communicate a sufficient degree of indifference. Is this really worth it? Does it cause all this? Was it worth Rosa Can you go to three? To be sent to the oh, you're the you're not Rosa against? Park, man. So you don't care to identify the people no, that are not at all. Try That's just, I'm just a bad cop that way. That's so you're a bad cop yep. that way? I'm just a bad cop, I do bad investigations. But unfortunately, every once in a while, when a sovereign holds their convictions deeply enough, things can turn deadly. They shoot a first cop, they shot one, he fell in the ditch. They all ran behind the car, and they shot him in the head. The case we're covering today is actually not such an instance, though the incident at the heart of it was no doubt deadly. As you likely already know, it took place on November 21st, 2021, when a man rammed his Ford Escape SUV through a crowd of people gathered at the Waukesha Christmas Parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, injuring 62 people and killing six, including an eight-year-old boy named Jackson Sparks. The man's name was Daryl Brooks, or Darrell Brooks, depending on who's saying it. But seeing as Mr. Brooks claims to not identify with his name, we'll just stick with the more common pronunciation to keep things simple. There is no evidence Darrell Brooks' attack was motivated by sovereign ideology. And while some have suggested or insinuated that it was a racially motivated attack, based on violent sentiments against whites that Brooks had previously expressed on social media, there's little if anything to support that beyond the existence of aforementioned sentiments. By all appearances, the attack was motivated, for lack of a better word, by a heated argument Brooks had with a woman named Erica Patterson, the estranged mother of his 15-year-old daughter. The two had been arguing during the day via phone messages, and that afternoon, Brooks drove his Ford Escape to Frame Park, just a block or so away from the parade route, to meet Patterson, who agreed to get in the car with him. The two drove around for a short time, during which an altercation broke out in the car. Brooks hit Patterson in the face, and she got out of the SUV. Brooks then continued following her in his car, culminating in a scuffle outside of White Rock School, with Patterson and her friends Corey Runkle and Nick Kirby, who Patterson had called to come help her after being hit by Brooks. The confrontation did not last long before Brooks got back in his car and drove off, with the attack commencing a matter of minutes later. If it doesn't make any sense to you that an act this brutal could really stem from something like rage over a domestic, that's perfectly understandable. But all available evidence points toward that senseless explanation. And as you'll soon see, doing and saying things that don't make sense isn't exactly out of character for Daryl Brooks. Sir, my concern here today is there's a request from your attorneys to withdraw from this case. Do you wish to represent yourself in this case? Yes, I do. I would like to represent myself pro per. What does that mean to you, sir? To represent myself as a sovereign citizen. I'm not going to make a determination, sir, whether you're a sovereign citizen or not. It's not relevant to my determination how you characterize who you are. 
other than you are accused of 77 counts, which I will go through momentarily. You have two very capable attorneys that have been with you from the beginning. You understand that, right? No, I do not understand that. So if you are allowed to represent yourself in this case, sir, you will not have attorneys assisting you. If I let them withdraw, they're gone from this case. Do you understand that? I think I will probably be better served representing myself. This channel has gone over how virtually no one under any circumstance is better served representing themselves before. But there's not much point in rehashing the particulars of why self-representation is a bad idea today. Because given the ironclad nature of the evidence against Daryl Brooks, competent defence attorneys are essentially rendered obsolete. A quick sampling of said evidence. He was captured on video getting into the Ford Escape and heading toward the parade route. He was again captured on video in the driver's seat of the Ford Escape as the attack was taking place. The Ford Escape was found a short time later with its front completely mangled and riddled with bullets fired at it during the attack. It was confirmed to be registered under Brooks' mother's name. Daryl Brooks was apprehended a mere blocks from where the Ford Escape was found. So while it's true pretty much anyone's odds of getting off will be many times greater with effective counsel, you can't multiply a zero. And the only way any jury would acquit a person under these sorts of circumstances would be if they were doing so just for kicks, which lawyers aren't allowed to ask for, just in case you were wondering. In fact, Brooks has perhaps the only valid reason for going the route of self-representation. That is, he wants to present arguments that no attorney with the rest of their career ahead of them would be caught dead making in a court of law. Like this one, for instance. I, I need clarification on how the state of Wisconsin can be a plaintiff, because that would essentially mean that the state of Wisconsin is the injured party. How could the state be the injured party? The case title in no way implies that the state of Wisconsin is an injured party in the matter. If that were the case, it would be so for every single criminal case in the United States, as all criminal cases are initiated by the government. A person can seek damages from another in relation to a criminal act that person committed, and that case would be titled Doe v. Brooks, but it would be a civil case, not a criminal one. If you're facing prison, it's always the state you're up against. And Brooks' raising of this complete non-starter issue is not merely an embarrassing instance of him being caught woefully undereducated and comically ill-prepared, but rather one of the central planks of his entire defense case. I don't, I still go back to the question I asked. I don't understand how they can represent an injured party. How can the state of Wisconsin? Sir, this is a legitimate case, and I'm not going to make a mockery by you asking that question. I am not going to get into a debate about whether you're a sovereign citizen or not, or even whether you have any understanding of how the state is a plaintiff in this case. You have demonstrated through this hearing that you don't have a basic understanding of some of the things that are going on. So I'm going to give you time to consider this request Talk with your attorneys more because they still represent you. They have not been discharged in this case. But of course, Brooks did not have a change of heart. His attorneys were discharged. And from there, the court, particularly presiding Judge Jenna Fedoro, had to deal not just with an onslaught of baseless legal theories, but raw belligerence so unrelenting that it is at times surreal to witness taking place in a setting as formal as a courtroom. As just one example, Brooks's supposed concern that he may have contracted COVID. I can't taste anything. That's what said, okay, now I need to put the uh, medical uh, sick When did you report sleeping. these symptoms to the medical people or to even just a correctional officer? Um, a few days ago. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Attorney Opper if there's anything you would want to provide or state at this time reg regarding this request? Yes, Your Honor, a couple of things. Number one, we believe this is nothing more than a further delay tactic by Mr. Brooks. I can advise the court uh, as an officer of the court and as an offer of proof that he is... 
how can how Mr. could that Brooks, did how you could that even opera interrupt you when you were talking? Well, I respectfully object. You can object. Your objections noted, but you need to let her state what she needs to state. I will give you an opportunity to respond. That, I'd encourage you to use paper and a pen. It is not ridiculous. During pre-trial, there doesn't tend to even be formal objection raising. Rather, each party will simply make their case on certain issues, one after the other, and the judge will make rulings. But even during trial, if you raise an objection and the judge overrules it, you're expected to respect that ruling and save any contentions you might have with it for a future appeal should you or your client be convicted. Brooks's flouting of this custom will be a prominent running theme of the trial. Go ahead, Attorney Opper. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, again, we believe this is a delay tactic. I can advise the court, uh, as an officer of the court, that Mr. Brooks has been saying for the last several weeks in his recorded jail calls to his mother and others that he's going to get this trial delayed or adjourned or pushed back. Certainly the court's offer to... I never once said... Mr. I never said an opportunity I never, no, momentarily. No, no you I need respectfully to stay object to that because that, that has no merit. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I, it's not your saying, time no, to speak. No, I respectfully object. He's saying she has jail phone calls. Well, why why aren't they present? Why can't they be verified by sworn affidavit and, and, and brought into this court? All right, Mr. Brooks, I've given you a little just bit of like, leeway because like we are outside the presence of the jury. I haven't, I haven't heard Mr. Brooks, I'm going to warn you now that you have interrupted a couple of times. No, because that's so he, now not, he's outright refusing here. to listen. I would not sit here talking not, over no, me at the moment. I didn't refuse anything. I didn't refuse Mr. anything. Mr. Brooks, we are at I'm the not, point I'm not, I'm not where I will put you in the other courtroom because and you I don't are not consent, able. I don't consent to being removed. I have not waived the right to be present, and I don't agree with that. This court decided that under the circumstances to remove Mr. Brooks from the courtroom and to continue the trial in his absence until and unless he promised to conduct himself in a manner befitting an American courtroom, that this is the proper response to his conduct. I am going to uh, unmute Mr. Brooks. Um, he can object. However, my expectation for that objection process would be that he say, I object. He provide a basis. I oftentimes give parties, give me one word. Is it hearsay? Is it, you know, calls for speculation? Is it irrelevant? It may be no coincidence that once the actual trial gets underway, just about every time Brooks objects, he will offer one of the three examples Judge Doro just gave as the basis for that objection, almost always misapplying it. Is your squad marked or unmarked? Objection irrelevant. It's relevant. Is it a reliable method of performing DNA analysis? Objection speculative. Overruled the witness may answer. Are you able to see the driver of the vehicle in this screenshot, sir? Objection hearsay. Overruled. What did you observe the path of travel for the SUV to be? Objection as hearsay. Mr. Brooks, it's not hearsay. Your objection is overruled. Can we answer? <laughs> what was the driver doing as it passed you? Objection irrelevant. As he passed you, I should say. Overruled. Objection. I do not Mr. consent Brooks, to being called he. Do you see that person in the courtroom today? Yes. Objection is hearsay. How he's speaking as a uh, first I am witness. Overruled. Objection speculative. It's not speculative. Overruled. The witness may answer. Objection hearsay. It's not hearsay. I mean, yeah, you overrule every objection. And the jury will disregard the additional commentary made by Mr. Brooks it's at this time. Additional misconduct at his finest. Can you describe the difference, if any, between Mr. Brooks' appearance today and his appearance on November 21st? Objection, hearsay, and speculative. It's neither one of those things. The objection is overruled. The witness may answer. Objection is irrelevant. It is relevant. He may answer. He's got very short hair right now, and he didn't then. Is that what Daryl Brooks looked like as he drove past you just a block or two earlier? Objection. I do not consent to being called that name. I do not know anyone by that name, nor do I agree to being called that name. And it's hearsay. It's not hearsay. Your objection's overruled. You get the idea. But what was that objection to his name all about? 
Well, this is another central plank of Brooks's defence, one he made a point of leading with at the beginning of each day's proceedings. The defendant, Daryl Brooks, appears in person in custody. He's also wearing a mask. I'm here today, Your Honor, I do not identify by that name and would like the opportunity to state that I'm here concerning this matter as a third party intervener, appearing as authorized representative for my client. And I accept for value in return for value all of the charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption available for discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts in the charging instruments and would like to now uh, reserve my rights if I may. Um, Mr. Brooks, you just interrupted me within a minute of us starting this case here today. And we will now interrupt poor Judge Doro to unpack the meaning of Brooks's declaration, with the caveat that there is a limit to how much you can make sense of nonsense. With the first line, Brooks is essentially distinguishing himself, the human being standing in court, from the party named by the state in their filings. It's not that he's literally claiming to be a different physical being in the same way that Daryl Brooks is a different physical being from Jennifer Doro, for instance, but he is claiming to be a different legal entity than the Daryl Brooks that carried out the parade attack. To try and clarify that a touch, let's move on to the second line. Except for value is a phrase you normally hear from sovereign citizens when they're trying to get out of paying their taxes. Now a bit of a detour here, but stay with us. Sovereigns believe they all have a million bucks sitting in a secret bank account under care of the US Treasury. They also believe the names on their birth certificates are invalid and refer to said names as a quote, straw man. Now that birth certificate is of significant value to the state as it essentially functions as a deed to your person, i.e. you or your straw man, a property of the United States, who can then use you as collateral to collect loans from the World Bank, hence the million bucks allocated to every straw man. But the money is not really yours of course, it's used by the government to do their government things. That is, unless you clue on to all of this and figure out how to claim your sovereignty as a living, breathing human being of the land. Now if the IRS send you an unwelcome collection notice, you can respond by simply writing accepted for value on the tax bill, and they will have to begrudgingly take the owed amount out of the secret straw man account, instead of robbing you, the living breathing human being, of your hard earned money. And no, this has never worked. So back to Brooks. The phrase except for value has seldom been used by a sovereign in the context of a criminal trial, so a bit of extrapolation is required when attempting to discern the intended meaning behind it in this context. It seems he's applying the same principle to the criminal charges he's facing. Just as one can direct the IRS to the non-existent straw man named on the tax bill, so too can they direct the court to the non-existent straw man named in the case. This makes the final half of his declaration pretty easy to sum up. He's claiming exemption from all matters in question given he is not the straw man and therefore should be discharged, even though he is not disputing any of the facts in the case which all clearly implicate him as being the perpetrator of these horrific crimes. Make sense? Oh well, it was worth a shot anyway. Back to proceedings. I'm asking you to respectfully not interrupt me, that's the second time, so I can go through the list of things that I need to get through this morning. I just wanted it stated for the record. Continued interruptions will result in you forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom, where you'll be taken to the courtroom next door to appear by video and audio I don't means to participate. To from the courtroom, in, That's another interruption. And you haven't shown me any lawful uh, case law that I can be removed from the court Mr. Brooks. proceedings in a trial and forced under coercion and, dis and, and duress. All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. I need to make a record that this court ordered Mr. Brooks be removed from the courtroom due to repeated interruptions and disruption. At one point, he took off a shoe and it appeared uh, to the deputies that he was going to throw the shoe. Um, you can see that he is seated with his back uh, to the court or to the camera. He took his shirt off as well. I'm also told that he is threatening to throw and break items. There was a lot of that sort of thing. 
But once the court did finally manage to push through all of Brooks's antics and start the trial proper, they did not allow him to derail the prosecution's case, excessive frivolous objections notwithstanding. The case they put on was more or less summed up in this video earlier, evidence doesn't really get more clean cut than this. All the same, this was obviously an extremely important case for the state of Wisconsin, so the prosecuting attorneys didn't take their position for granted and left no stone unturned, painstakingly establishing just about every move Daryl Brooks made in the time leading up to, during, and following the parade attack on November 21st, with the help of hundreds of exhibits and carefully selected witnesses. And Brooks's cross-examinations of those witnesses were almost uniformly abysmal. Do you recall any uh, disturbances that afternoon? Do you mean when you drove through the parade routes and? Uh, Your question was a little broad. Any suspect is innocent until proven guilty. Would that be fair to say? That's correct. And so, with that knowledge, why are you so adamant about? the name of the suspect that you just testified to not being aware of at the time, that you testified to, in fact, being told. I'm sorry, I'm confused by your question. You say it again. I think it was clear, but I'll say it again. Thank you. Well, I'll say it this way. Is it fair to say that people leave all types of information in, in family members' vehicles at any time. Objection, Grounds. irrelevant, speculation. Sustained. Grounds for the sustain. Ask your next question, Mr. Brooks, please. May I have the grounds, please? The court's not answering that. The record is self-evident. Is that a tacit agreement? Um, sir, I don't know what a tacit agreement is, so please keep going. Clearly know what it is. Um, would it be fair to say that because you describe it as a traumatic event, that there was a lot of things that you probably don't recall about the incident? I would agree with that. I would think that there's a lot of things um, when I became, uh, when I started going up West Main Street and started seeing the absolute destruction, I, I know there's things that I did and saw that I don't really remember and I don't really want to remember. Will one of those possibly be the suspect that you keep naming? No. Perhaps the biggest weapon in Daryl Brooks's cross-examination arsenal was his contention that the state of Wisconsin bringing a case against him was inherently illegitimate, and no amount of sustained objections or reprimanding from Judge Doro would deter him from pursuing this angle. Just so I'm clear, you have never had any, any interaction with the plaintiff. Objection. Sustained. You've never seen the plaintiff. Objection. Sustained. Never spoken to the plaintiff. Objection. Sustained. Never seen. Uh, do you see the plaintiff in court today? Objection. Sustained. How long have you known the plaintiff? Objection. Vague and irrelevant. Sustained. Are you aware of the plaintiff in this case? Objection. Grounds. Sustained. Have you had any interactions with the state of Wisconsin? Objection. Grounds. Sustained. Do you understand that for uh, charges to be issued that it has to be a claim, therefore it has to be a plaintiff? Uh, objection. Grounds. It's not relevant. That would be the grounds. You also have to state the grounds. Hold on. Let her get her position out, Mr. Brooks. Are you aware of the identity of the plaintiff in this matter? Objection. Grounds. Not relevant. Grounds. It's not relevant. Sustained. Do you know if there is a plaintiff in this matter? Objection. But Daryl Brooks's misunderstanding of the law and rules of court had consequences beyond just wasting everyone's time. An issue that became apparent early on was Brooks's inability to grasp the concept of opening the door. Here's a quick explanation of how that works. Before a trial commences, attorneys will argue for what should and should not be fair game to be brought up, and usually there will be quite a few grey areas on that count that the judge will need to rule on. 
Let's say you're on trial for stealing cookies from a cookie jar. You were captured on film in the general vicinity of the cookie store shortly before the cookies were first reported missing. Receipts prove you bought nothing but a single serve carton of milk from a nearby grocery store mere minutes later, and crumb residue consistent with cookie matter was later found in your clothing. This is all clearly pertinent to the prosecution's theory, and so naturally is allowed in. But then it comes out that years earlier you confessed to stealing cookies from a friend's house but were able to reach some sort of out of court settlement. Now this could go either way. The prosecution would likely argue that a prior history consistent with the crime in question is clearly relevant and should be able to be disclosed at trial, while the defense would counter that the information is unfairly prejudicial. It is this specific instance of cookie theft that you're on trial for, and you should be judged purely on the merits of the evidence that directly relates to this instance, rather than have the jury's opinion of you tainted by past actions that you are not on trial for and weren't even formally convicted of. The judge rules in your favour, the prosecution cannot bring up the previous incident at trial. But then later, during the trial, your lawyer calls a character witness and asks the question, have you ever known my client to steal cookies from a stranger before? To which they answer no, painting a picture that is technically true because it was a friend you stole cookies from in the past, but still substantially misleading. Now the judge may rule that your attorney has opened the door to the evidence that was ruled inadmissible, and the state is now allowed to bring up the prior cookie theft, because if the defense is going to argue that a lack of prior history is an exculpatory factor, it's only fair that the prosecution should be allowed to counter that contention. Not all legal jive has to be academic, opening the door is a very easy concept to understand. But as stated, Brooks still managed to struggle with it as seen in his cross-examination of Corey Runkle, an associate of his former partner Erica Patterson who was involved in the confrontation with Brooks shortly before the parade attack. One of the lesser of the 76 charges that Brooks was facing was battery, on account of Patterson's accusation that Brooks had struck her in the car that day. Patterson had made previous accusations of domestic violence against Brooks, but those were ruled inadmissible. At any time before November 21st of 2021, did Erica ever confide any information to you before that day? She did. Um, what was the nature of the, uh, the information? It's not allowed to be brought up. She's referring to a pretrial ruling that she's aware of. Yeah. So, you want to rethink asking that question, sir? Otherwise, I'm going to allow her to answer it. What pre-child? Uh, I'm not going to state. Uh, no, that I'm not. Right now. Are we both privy to the same pre-trial procedure? There was a pre-trial ruling about. Do you want her to answer that question or do you want to move on? I want to move on. All right, I'll strike that question from the record. The jury will disregard the question that was asked. Um. The reason a member of the prosecution team decided to intervene to protect Brooks is likely the same as why Judge Doro is at times what some might consider to be excessively patient with him. Because of the importance of this case, both the court and the state want to play a perfect game here. That is, leave nary a shred of material behind that a future appellate lawyer might be able to point to to argue that Brooks was given anything less than a fair shake, not even letting him hang himself with his own ignorance without first alerting him to the rope he's pulling out. But that doesn't mean there is no limit to what they'll let him get away with. And on day 11 of the trial, Brooks opened another door before anyone was able to save him. The issue at hand concerned a further cementing of Brooks's connection to the Ford Escape by demonstrating he was filmed standing in front of it in a music video he had made under the stage name Mothboy Fly. The court had allowed the prosecution to display a still image from the video to demonstrate this one point. The full video, however, was not allowed in, as it was liable to paint a picture in some jurors' minds of Daryl Brooks as something less than an upstanding member of society. There's a video that we obtained from social media that shows Mr. Brooks standing next to 
the SUV and you can clearly see the license plate number on the vehicle. Detective Casey, is uh, the person you know is Daryl Brooks in this photograph? Objection, I'll consent to being called their name and leading the witness. Overruled. Witness the answer. Yes, he is. Please circle or X or mark in some fashion. How do you know that's Daryl Brooks there? His back is to us. Objection, lead. Overruled. I've watched the video in its entirety and I've seen his face in the video. Let's go back to exhibit 175. You pull that up for the witness. All right, just, go ahead. It's in the jury. You box. just testified that this was the alleged defendant. How do you know that? Can you see the face <coughs> on the circle individual in that exhibit? In this clip, I cannot see the face of the person that is circled. So how do you know who it is? I can tell who that is because I have watched this video in its entirety, and I can tell that it is you based on all of my contacts with you. Is it fair to say that this is the only exhibit photo from the video? Go ahead. Can you uh, clarify the only one that is shown today or the only one that has ever been taken? The only, the only, one, that that's, the only one that's being please. shown right here today. <laughs> is this the only one that is an exhibit being shown here today? Yes, this is the only one that we've shown today. So not so much opening the door as blowing it off the goddamn hinges. And at this point, no one at the prosecution table felt any need to whisper free legal advice into Daryl Brooks's ear. Exhibit 178. Objection. I objection to that. Why, why does the whole video need to be played? Is, is this setting the foundation? It's relevant. You questioned the officer about it. You questioned the question detective about, about I his question knowledge. Him about the steel frame from the video. The video wasn't even in, in the exhibits that I received. It actually didn't even receive it. Mr. Brooks, please stop. The jury will disregard his statements. He's not testifying. The video's playing. A lot of <coughs> You were questioned on cross-examination as to your ability to identify Mr. Brooks in Exhibit 175, correct? Objection. That question was asked initially by Attorney Hopper. Overruled. The yeah. witness may answer. Sorry. Yes, I was. As you just watched the entire video again now in court, as states exhibit 178, did you clearly see Mr. Brooks in that video, sir? Objection. Leading. Overruled. The witness may answer. I believe there's no doubt that that's Mr. Brooks in the video and later standing next to the forest escape. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. As to this particular piece of evidence only, Mr. Brooks, you may uh, ask questions of Detective Casey. Objection, I don't consent to being called that name. And yet, Noted. I, I Do you have questions. any questions for the witness? This, uh, when, when did this video, when was this made an exhibit? Because I don't have it. Objection, that's not a question for the witness, Your Honor. That, that was a question. A question. When was this as to the video form of the question. When was this video made an exhibit? That is a question. And one that demonstrates Daryl Brooks's relentless ignorance of the rules of court. The contention he's making and will absolutely refuse to let up on, no matter how many times it's explained to be utterly baseless, is that the existence of the music video as an exhibit at the disposal of the state was something that was required to be disclosed to him in advance of Detective Thomas Casey's testimony. Leaving aside the fact we have every reason to believe this information was given to him during the discovery phase, he is still wrong. It's great for both sides to get as many of their ducks in a row as possible before proceedings commence, but trials are fluid, stuff comes up, and accordingly new exhibits are able to be introduced as things unfold, so long as counsel can lay evidentiary foundation that satisfies the judge as to its relevance and compliance with the rules of evidence. I object to the question directed at the witness, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope of his knowledge. Well, he said he saw it. But that's not the question asked. So you can rephrase your question if you want to. When did, when did you see this exhibit? When did you see it? With the understanding that you're asking when did he see the video, I will when allow the question When did you see this exhibit? Asked. With that understanding, you may answer, Detective Casey. 
I saw the video uh, within a few days of Mr. Brooks being arrested. I reviewed it yesterday and again this morning. Why did you need to see it again to make sure if any questions were asked or however you refer to it? What, what would be the need to view, view again something that you had viewed numerous times before? Objection. I'll see what I can Well, objection. Compound, asked and answered, misstatement of the facts, argumentative, sustained. Did you view the video this morning because you knew that the video would be made an exhibit this morning? Objection, assumes facts, not in evidence. Sustained. As to the form of the question. This is mine, by the way. This is mine, by the way. Can you clarify again why you viewed the video this morning? Objection, asked and answered. Sustained. So you're going to sustain everything? It was already answered, sir. Next question, please. And I'm asking for clarification. Next question, please. I don't, I don't got no more questions, man. All right. Thank you. This is my body. Detective, you may step down. I'll excuse she, the jury. What people are trying to do is not fair. You're not asking me to reconsider it based on any legal there basis. Should, there should be a legal, a legal reconsideration of it. Then you need to provide me with the legal basis for that, sir. So I'm supposed to just come off that with the top off the top of my head? Yes. That's ridiculous. You're representing yourself. It's not ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So I was supposed to I was supposed to already come in here this morning and say, oh, a video is going to be shown off the fly at the at the drop of a hat. Let me try to find some legal thing to combat. Mr. How am Brooks, I supposed to do you that? Open, the bottom line is you open the door to it the doesn't, playing it of doesn't, that video. We're not talking about and the opening video was doors. previously provided to you during discovery. We're not talking There's about opening those doors. We're talking no. about being fair. And with that, the prosecution's case came to a close. And it was time for Daryl Brooks to present his case. And at the very beginning of it, something seemed to be amiss. There was an air of purpose and concentration emanating from Brooks as he rifled through his papers that had never been apparent before this stage. A furrow in his brow that made one wonder if there might be some kind of trick up his sleeve that the state had not anticipated. What sort of cunning move could he possibly be planning? You may call your first witness. Uh, the defense would like to call the plaintiff state of Wisconsin to the stand. I object. The objection is noted. It is sustained. Call your next witness, please. Reason for the sustain? Not relevant. And you haven't named a person to go along with that. The subpoena was accepted, Your Honor. Call your next witness, please. Bearing in mind again the insurmountable evidence against him, and all of the disadvantages that come with self-representation, the rest of Daryl Brooks's defense was still an abject disaster. His first witness, Nicholas Kirby, another party to the confrontation before the parade attack, clearly didn't like him, to put it mildly going out of his way to answer questions in a manner that was as unhelpful as possible to Brooks's case. You stated that you had a description of the vehicle. Would that be fair to say? Yes. How did you learn of the description of the vehicle at that point? Ms. Patterson told me over the phone that she was in a red SUV. There aren't many red SUVs with young women screaming for help in Waukesha. After the altercation between Ms. Patterson, Mr. Brooks, Ms. Corey, and myself, the three of us, we started to leave. I told Mr. Brooks, you need to get out of here. The police have been called. You need to leave. You need to leave now. You do not belong here. Did you see anyone injured that day during the parade? When the Yes, after I walked back through that area. You saw someone get injured? I saw a red SUV take off like a bat out of hell down Main Street did and go see? through a crowd of people. The question was, did you see, did you see this take place? With my own freaking eyes, yes. How many times do I have to say yes for you to understand it? Uh, you made reference to uh, Mr. Brooks. Um, who's that? That would be you. And why would you say it would be you? That's you. 
because that's your name. No further questions. Before I decide whether to do cross at this time, how long do you believe it will be? Zero minutes because I have no cross. All right, thank you. And you can step down. And we're going to take a break. And it really only got worse for Daryl Brooks from there. For the most part, his witnesses were so ineffective that it was at times difficult to discern why he even called them in the first place, though seemingly it was to call attention to the fact statements the police collected contained small details that did not completely align with the state's prosecution theory. The problem was, the witnesses did not exactly have perfect recall of everything they said a year ago. Were you able to make a description of who was driving? I believe so. And what do you recall? I don't recall what I said. Do you recall a height? I think he was probably anywhere between 5'6 six and 6'0". Six I really couldn't tell because of the angle. I'm assuming then your patio is kind of on an a upward base type of angle that you would have kind of been looking sort of down? I was looking down, down yes. Okay. Do you recall what you saw? No. Do you recall making the statements where it says one was described as running southbound on Maple Tours College Avenue? Do you recall that? No, I don't. Do you recall what the operator of the vehicle was wearing at the time that he passed you? I do not remember. At that time, I didn't have my glasses on, so I could not see clearly. What did you see that day, if you recall? I saw a red SUV plow over a bunch of people. Did you see the driver of this SUV you're referring to? Yeah, you're standing right there. It was clear from looking at Daryl Brooks during this portion of the trial that the stunning ineffectiveness of his witnesses was getting to him, and true to form, he managed to find a conspiracy behind their vague memories. Go ahead, Mr. Brooks. Uh, I'm curious, some of these, um, judging by the reports, how are some of these answers allowed to, to pass when they're coming straight from reports made by the people on the stand. Very curious. I don't understand your question. Are you... I'm not sure what you're asking me. To be blunt, which I've been since the beginning of this trial, obviously, I see the whole strategy here by the prosecution. I, I see right through it. Don't have any cross-examination, mainly because you, you've already schooled the people getting on the stand on how to answer certain things. Sir. You could ask questions that establish that. You can ask them if they've met with anyone. You haven't done that. So for you to s say that right now is without basis. I'm so not hearing you... a request from you at this time. You said you wanted to raise a legal issue. What's the legal issue? The legal issue is what, how, how is the state allowed to coach the You're people You're assuming they stand? spoke to them and coached them. It's obvious. I'm not, I'm not stupid. Well, I disagree with that, sir. If he wasn't so stupid, Daryl Brooks may have been able to figure out that even if his witnesses were deliberately pretending to not recall exactly what they reported last November in order to sabotage him, they likely wouldn't have needed any encouragement from the district attorney's office to do so, given he was the most hated man in Waukesha, and consequently you'd be hard-pressed to find a single resident of the city who wouldn't want to avoid helping his cause at all costs. In any event, his insipid protestations were as fruitless as always, and he eventually managed to quit bitching and call his next witness, a woman named Kathleen Urell, who honestly might have produced the least eventful direct examination yet. Do you recall if you saw who was operating that vehicle? Unfortunately, sir, I can't recall. Do you recall if you might have seen uh, multiple people in the vehicle at that time? Or? You know, unfortunately, due to the time passing, I cannot recall. That's fair. It has been a while. Do you recall about what time that was that you observed the vehicle? Again, I, I can't be sure. Sorry if I keep asking. No, I, I can't be sure. I'm sorry. At the, at the time that you observed the, the vehicle, did you see it strike anyone? I did not, or at least I don't recall. I'm sorry. (coughs) 
Do you recall if the vehicle had any tinted windows? Uh, I couldn't recall. I'm any sorry. windows rolled down or up at the time you observed it? No, unfortunately, I don't remember. No further questions right now. Hey, Cross. Yes, thank you. The prosecution used their cross-examination of Urell mainly just to establish some background. How many children do you have, Miss Miss Urell? Objection, irrelevant. All the world. Man. Four children. All four of your kids were marching in the parade that day, weren't they? Yes. Objection, lady. Sorry. Your oldest daughter, Charlotte, she was 14 at the time? Yes. She was marching with the extreme dance group as an alumni, wasn't she? She was handing Object. out candy. Oh, there was an objection. It's overruled. I didn't even state why I was objecting, but okay. When you were standing in the crosswalk at White Rock in Maine, could you see the Five Points intersection? I could not. You didn't see your kids get hit, did you? I did Objection. not. Objection. Leading. Sorry. Overall. Again, sorry. Objection. Hearsay. Overall. Did you see them later that night? Objection. Lead. Overall. You may answer. <laughs> I was only able to see two of my children that night. When did you see the other two? <laughs> Days later, when I was able to leave Children's Hospital. Charlotte suffered a chipped vertebrae from being struck, didn't she? She Objection. did. Objection. Sorry, Leave. Overruled. She did. Your daughter, Alice, she was 10 at the time, wasn't she? She was. <coughs> she suffered chipped front teeth, is that correct? Yes. And facial scarring? Yes. And road rash? Yes. And a broken fibula and tibia? Yes. And broken metatarsal bones? Yes. She was observed in a concussion protocol, is that correct? She was. Your daughter Vivian, she was marching with the extreme dance group too, wasn't she? Yes, she was. How old was she in November of 21? She just turned seven. Vivian suffered a severe concussion, didn't she? Objection, lady. Yes. And road rash? Extreme road rash. And a lung contusion? Yes. And facial scarring? Yes. And your seven year old daughter Vivian suffered a broken tailbone, didn't she? She did. Your son, Grayson, he was eight on November 21st, 2021, is that correct? That is Jackson correct. Lady. He was walking with the extreme dance group, handing out candy, is that right? He was. He went to the hospital after the parade, didn't he? Yes. He suffered a compound fracture in his femur, is that correct? An open compound fracture. Meaning the bone came through the skin? Yes. I don't believe he's a doctor. Overruled, the witness may answer based upon personal knowledge. Was that a yes? Yes. A police officer saved Grayson's life by placing a tourniquet on that open leg wound, is that correct? Yes. I don't have any other questions. No redirect. So, from the perspective of the defense, Kathleen Urell's testimony was, let's just say, less than helpful. And by the time he got around to calling his last witness, Daryl Brooks was just about at the end of his tether. You said you observed multiple officers trying to stop the vehicle. Is that correct? Yes. Do you recall if you told the FBI agents? <coughs> it's been a year. I, I 
believe so, but it's been a year. When you say it's been a year, I'm assuming that means that some details you don't quite recall all the way. Would that be fair to say? Yes. So it would be fair to say that if there's details you don't recall, how can you recall half the travel of the SUV that you claim you saw? Can you, can you rephrase the question? I'm not understanding. I think it was clear, but I, I'll, I'll ask again. <clears throat> you just acknowledged that there may be some details that you don't quite recall. So would it be fair to say that you don't quite recall the path of travel of the vehicle? No, that is not correct. So you recall all the details of what you observed that evening, November 21st, 2021? No. So what other details do you not recall? <laughs> you're under, how does someone <coughs> recall the details that they don't recall? Yeah, that's what I want to ask. Sustain this to the form of the question. <laughs> Seems very funny. Seems almost as if you're recalling what you want to recall and purposely not Recall. Objection. Don't. Badgering the witness. Yes. Sustained. You do not have to answer that and you are warned. You may not badger or argue with this witness. Next question. Badger or argue? What do you mean? Next question. What do you mean? Don't intimidate the witness is what I mean. How am I intimidating the witness? Badgering the witness by eye rolling, by pursing your lips, <coughs> by making facial movements uh, regarding That's her inti answers is, so intimidating? is Badgering the witness. Are you kidding me? Ask your next question you, or the questioning of this how witness are you will even end. A judge? How are you even a judge? All right, you may step down, ma'am. Thank you. How are you even a judge? Come on, man. I'm tired of being in the courtroom that has no integrity whatsoever. How can you even call yourself Mr. a judge? Brooks, I need to make a record of some I need things. to make a record too. You don't when am I going to get the chance to do that? All right. I need to make a record. He's being removed to the other courtroom. He is yelling at me. He's not going to let me make a statement or make the record that I need to make. I'm finna, I'm finna he hasn't anyway, sat so down do for the better part of two hours. You, want. you can hold me in contempt all you want. I'm not holding you, you in do contempt. Is is criminal or civil, so I can hit right. you with you. I need to clear the courtroom because I do need I'm to make. I'm you what you know is coming. I need him to go to the if other courtroom civil, because I do need to put some things on the civil, record. The record should reflect the contract between you that and I. Mr. Brooks is criminal, yelling at me. What is the crime? He's, he is, Who makes the claim? And what is, is I will make the record when we get back. I will step off. But Mr. Brooks, you're being it taken no, to Mr. the next no courtroom. Mr. Don't try to address me Thank like you. that like we cool. You don't have no integrity. How can you even call yourself a judge? Making tacky agreements, being biased, judicial misconduct, trying to steal somebody's... And from there it was time for closing arguments. Lead prosecutor Sue Opper began her presentation by addressing one of Brooks's core contentions, just on the off chance there might be a single juror who wouldn't recognize it to be ridiculous on its face. You've watched these proceedings and you've noticed as we sit at our prosecution table, we don't have a client at our table. But rest assured, we do represent someone. We represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity. I can't bring it to the courtroom. People enact laws. People want to feel safe. People have representatives in Madison or Washington, D.C. that set standards, rules that we all are expected to live by. Daryl Brooks does not represent anybody. He does not have a client. Daryl Brooks is the client. Daryl Brooks is the defendant. The state of Wisconsin is the plaintiff. It's really that simple. And it's consistent with any other criminal case you've ever heard about at any other time in any other jurisdiction. It runs the same. Why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent, I do have to prove. And I submit without any doubt, there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Daryl Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. He plowed through 68 
different people. 68. How can you hit one and keep going? How can you hit two and keep going? How can you hit three and keep going? Didn't phase him a bit. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. Nicole White, our first victim, walking with Remax and a hot air balloon. Knocks her over, keeps going, runs up and over the backs of Waukesha South Band. Hits the green children spectating on the sidewalk, keeps going, runs over Kelly Grabo and her daughter Adelia walking with Burris Logistics, keeps going, plows through the entire extreme dance team just before the five points, keeps going, hits Deborah Ramirez and her son Isaac spectating on the south side of the street, keeps going, clears the five points area, hits Jane Kulik, square on, causing her to go up on the hood of the car, and then fall off and drives over her body. He doesn't stop, he keeps going. Runs through the kids over by the steaming cup, we heard the parents testify about little Brinley and Kelsey and Owen that were standing there outside the steaming cup. They were struck by the red SUV, driven by Daryl Brooks. Keeps going. Plows through the grannies in that zigzag fashion, striking most of them, injuring them, killing them. Keeps going. Gets down here to the end and goes through the uh, Catholic community. Tell me this does not prove intent. Please play. Keep watching the left side of your screen. That's intent, folks. No reasonable person is going to come across a group of teenagers playing band instruments and drive over them and keep going. We asked the court to take time to have you go look at this car in person because it's remarkably amazing <coughs> that this damage was caused by human beings. That's intent. It's time for Daryl Brooks to stop running. It's time for him to stop lying. It's time for him to be held accountable for his actions. Daryl Brooks cowardly rammed his way through this parade, violently killing and injuring so many people. I ask you to add up the evidence. Use the map, one fifth, I'm sorry, 15. You can check off the names, we've covered them all. Walk down that street like we did with you. Return guilty ver verdicts on all counts. Please. It was mentioned earlier in this video that the only way any jury would acquit a person under these sorts of circumstances would be if they were doing so just for kicks. And it just so happens that was essentially what Daryl Brooks' game plan boiled down to rules of procedure. It is my job to make sure there's effective and efficient administration of this trial. So, you so are then, then I'm, I should be allowed to, then if that's the case, then I should be allowed to tell the jury what they need to know, which is the truth. That they have the power. They have the power to nullify laws. To you reasons. are absolutely not allowed to tell the jury that. There's a jury instruction that I will have ready to go if you even attempt to raise the issue of jury nullification, oh, so, sir. You have absolutely no right to raise that. That is oh, clear I can, under I can, the law. I can, raise, I can raise what I want to raise. 
Jury nullification is a rather interesting topic, and one you're very unlikely to hear raised inside of a courtroom. If you ever find yourself sitting on a jury, no matter the case, it's basically a given that at some point the judge will give you an instruction to the effect of, you should reach your decision based on the law, not what you think the law should be. And the reason the court stress that you cannot just disregard the facts of a case and return whatever verdict accords to your whims, is because you absolutely can. The reason for this is that in a jury trial, the jury's verdict is the end of the line. The outcome can't simply be vetoed by the judge, as this would effectively invalidate the entire system, nor can jurors be punished for faulty or non-existent reasoning. So return for a moment to our example of the cookie theft trial, except this time, instead of putting yourself in the defendant's shoes, imagine you're sitting in the jury box. The prosecution put on a stellar presentation implicating the defendant as the culprit. The only thing is, something about the owner of the cookie store really rubs you the wrong way. Maybe he reminds you of a boss you can't stand, or has a smirk that irritates you. It might have come out during the trial that his favourite band is Maroon 5. For whatever reason, you just don't like the guy, and you think the defendant seems pretty chill. None of this is legal grounds for anything, but all the same, when you get back to the jury room, you just go, nah. Well, then that's that. Even if you can't bring your fellow jurors around to your way of thinking, it'll still be a hung jury resulting in a mistrial, and the state's probably not going to try to start from scratch again. We're talking about stolen biscuits here, God knows how things even went this far in the first place. Whether jury nullification is a bug or a feature of the justice system depends on one's worldview. But regardless, attorneys are absolutely forbidden from bringing its existence to the attention of a jury, and any who would dare try would be on a fast track to disbarment. But Daryl Brooks, of course, is not an attorney, and that reality posed a real problem to the court in the lead up to his closing argument. So this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument to the jury. Please start. I've uh, started the timer I'm uh, of one hour. I'm informed of that, Your Honor, but I'm not ready to proceed as I don't understand the uh, reason why the questions asked before the jury was present were not answered. Did you inform They will the be jury? informed of the law. Did you inform them that they Mr. can Brooks? nullify the law? Mr. Brooks, you do not have that right to request that. And I'm advising informed? you, one more time, this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument. Please begin. I intend to. When ready, I just want to know if the jury was informed that they can nullify the law. All right. I'm going to excuse the jury. They should, they should know that they have the power. Please rise for the jury. Time has now come for you to present a closing argument. There will be no further delays. It's I not will not be taking any further um, adjournments. I'm going to let them That's know. That's another interruption. No, I'm going to let them know that they have rights and that they should be told, informed of the truth. It's not me are trying to give. Are you telling me, sir, that you're not are trying going to, to give? Dis let me ask you a no, question. Hello. I'm not trying to give any sir, jury you're instruction. Me. Your Honor, how can I not inform them that they have a power? How can because I not, not inform right them of a power that they issue? Mr. Brooks, it never was brought up. If you but think then I when I raised the issue, you Your Honor, think let me that finish. I'm not prepared to deal with an argue on jury nullification. I didn't say I, that's not what I said. Here we you go with this. You can roll your eyes Here at we, me because all you want. It's ridiculous, Your Honor. You Under what lawful law? Under State versus Anthony. That's that. It doesn't refer to that. But the reasoning. You just said it right there. But you can't practice law from the bench. Sir, I'm you not can't do that. Law from the bench. I you are. If you're changing, if you're, ch Your Honor, I'm not you're making, attempting. You're attempting to make a, a, a. Are you willing to make a closing argument, sir, that does not reference jury nullification? I'm going to inform inform the jury of their power. I am in in creating a rule for your closing argument that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in any way. That is the rule I vehemently for your closing to that. argument. I vehemently object to that. You're for the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your rule? You will forfeit your right you can't to do that. Uh, present a closing under argument. Under what lawful law can you... And then if you continue to interrupt me... Under what me, lawful law... You will be removed to the other courtroom as I complete the So I'm being held in contempt again. Is it civil or criminal? Your Honor. Right. Go ahead. I apologize. May I 
ask the court to consider perhaps an alternative. We all know the defendant in his petulance will say jury nullification in the first three seconds the jury's in the room. Objection the to that. Proper I don't thing think to do, I, I think, Your Honor. Stop interrupting, Attorney Opper, I think Opera, I should please. be talked down to. Allow him to make his closing argument. I will object if he misstates the law. You can instruct the jury to disregard any misstatements of the law. And if it becomes to the point where there's no credible argument that's being made, then the court can decide as to whether or not he's forfeited his right to a closing argument. Try that or something similar to that in an effort to get through this next step or else we will continue at this pace forever. I'm certainly willing to try that. And so try that they did. And just as Sue Opper predicted. You have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection. Move to strike the statement. Sustain. Objection. I will strike from the record the last statement made by the defendant. The jury is, will disregard it. Which is clearly what I've been saying. So kind of an anti-climax, really setting the tone for the rest of Brooks's presentation, which may have been the most hollow, unmoving speech ever committed to tape. It's hard to keep everything together emotionally. Um, and honestly, I don't believe that I have any more tears left. Um, it's, it's been a hard year. So I go back to trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened in the last year. Praying for those families, praying for the people that tragically lost their life because it, it, that should not be lost either. The fact that there was lives lost and all the emphasis has been put on the alleged defendant makes me wonder, does the DA even care about those people? I'm happy to say that my conscience is clear. I believe in your heart you know you know what's right. Thank you. Ultimately, no one on the jury did get an urge to nullify the law, and Daryl Brooks was convicted of all 76 charges and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole, an outcome that certainly didn't wreak havoc on the betting markets. One thing that was notably absent from his closing was any appeal to sovereign ideology, and the likely reason for that was captured on the evening he was apprehended. Brooks also had no hesitance identifying by his given name later that evening when he was being interviewed by the police. Um, can you spell your first name again for me? Uh, D-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Whoever got in Daryl Brooks's ear about states being plaintiffs, you not being the name on your birth certificate, and all the other stuff he seemed to know a cue card's worth of information about is anyone's guess. But the fact that he by all appearances wasn't even aware of this worldview before trial raises the question of whether he truly believed any of it, or just thought it was the best tool to disrupt the process and delay his inevitable conviction as much as possible. Our guess is a little from column A, a little from column B. It's certainly true that Brooks clearly doesn't fully understand the rationale behind the arguments he's making, insofar as there is anything to understand. But that raw indignation, or petulance as Attorney Opper so aptly termed it, that he displayed whenever his arguments were summarily dismissed, seemed to be nothing but authentic. Certain ideas have a way of finding certain people. A lot of people probably said a lot of things to Daryl Brooks during the time he awaited trial, but when someone came along with a theory that posited he couldn't be held accountable for his actions, for reasons just about everyone else was too stupid to understand, it's no wonder he took to it like a duck to water. Pretty much every sovereign you'll see captured on body cam or cell phone footage share something in common. An expectation that others show them the utmost courtesy and respect, coupled with utter disbelief in the face of any suggestion they should be expected to do the same in turn. If Daryl Brooks is not the embodiment of such an attitude, we don't know who is. And that grotesque petulance served to create a sort of second tragedy that was quietly present throughout the entire trial. 
a knowledge that all of the families impacted by Brooks's actions, who had been waiting for a final chapter to this nightmare that would close things with the sort of dignity their loved ones deserved, instead got this. Some might say that pious closing statements notwithstanding, so long as this channel is signal boosting the monstrosity, it's as much a part of the problem as anything else. And they would have a point. No one's perfect, and there seems to be something innate in just about all of us that can't resist gawking at a freak show once in a while. In terms of finding a way to give the victims some of that sorely deserved dignity, well the surviving victims and families salvaged it themselves just fine through their impact statements, all of which were moving, but we can hardly play them all, nor is it the sort of thing that one wants to play favourites with as it were, and no amount of words could perfectly capture the collective feelings of those impacted. But there was one moment where in not much more than two seconds, one family member managed to perfectly capture ours. Once they start, I expect you to Come be quiet. Come on with it, because that, that's what you've been waiting to do to us. Listen up and listen what she has to say. Right. God damn. 